Welcome to The Practice Podcast, a show created by lawyers to help lawyers in life and business without all the complicated lawyer language. Let's welcome Bast Amron founders and your hosts, Jeff Bast and Brett Amron. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Brett. How are you? Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Welcome back. We're back in the same studio. We're in the studio together. Today's our first day back from summer break. Your first day. Both of our first day where both of us are back. Oh, there you go. Fair enough. How does it feel to be in the same room as me again? I mean, I know that's got to be heartwarming for you. Heartwarming. There you go. It's heartwarming. Feels good. It's good to be back. Breaks are good. Summer is great. I love the pace of summer for, you know, a, a brief moment. It allows you to re charge and then get back to work. So I'm ready to go. Well, let's do it then. I'm glad we're doing it with the special guest today, Ebony Smith. Ebony is a leadership development specialist and the founder of Ebonum Equation, which is dedicated to cultivating forward thinking leaders like yourself, Mr. Amron. With over two decades of risk management experience at Fortune 100 companies, such as small companies such as Sunoco, BP, World Fuel Services, Ebony has a comprehensive understanding of leadership that enables her to empower individuals to achieve their goals and realize their full potential. Her expertise in operational and financial risk management has led her to focus on transformational risk management, partnering with clients to design and develop leadership resilience and strategies. As a master certified coach, Ebony founded Ebonum Leadership Academy to transform leaders into coaches themselves. Her innovative and practical approach encourages individuals to shift from a subject matter expert mindset to a relationship-oriented approach that drives their organizations forward. And with her expertise and dedication to leadership development, Ebony has become a respected authority in the field. She is also a faculty member at Florida International University's Center for Leadership, and perhaps most importantly, Ebony was a panelist at our fifth annual Business Advantage Forum. I'm kidding about the highest That's top of the list for sure. At that panel, she discussed recruiting and retention strategies for a competitive market. And you can hear that recording because I'm sure you're going to want to listen to more Ebony after this episode. You can hear it on episode 102 of the Practice Podcast. Welcome, Ebony. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you both. Welcome. We are so happy to have you back. Back Talking to us. Absolutely. First time on the podcast for us with you. So how did you get to this point where you started Ebonum and both Ebonum entities and became a, a coach? Do you call yourself a coach? Let's start with that. Do you call of yourself course, a coach? Of course, yeah. I'm a master certified coach. There's yeah. only about 600 of us in the world. 600 in the world. Yeah. Wow. Accredited by the ICF according to the 2021 numbers. And then about 3% of us are of color. Okay. Wow. So, so wow. just for our listener, what does ICF stand for? International Coaching Federation. Okay. And I assume there's a series of courses or events you have to attend and things you have to pass and, in order to get that certification. How long does that normally take? It took me about five and a half years. Wow. It's a 20, real thing. It's a real thing. It's yeah. like 2,500 one-on-one client sessions. Wow. Yeah. So, and then exams and then education. It's been a good journey for right? yeah. me. But yeah, th- that's why a lot of people don't do it. Can you tell us how you got to that point where you started that? Because you spent a lot of time at large you know, Fortune 100 companies mm-hmm. and then made a move to become a coach. Absolutely. I remember the first time I started a new job where I knew that I was going to have to influence and impact people. And at some point, I didn't feel like I had enough skills. Mm-hmm. So I hired a coach on my own outside the company and started doing leadership development programs on my own so that I could be a competent person that was influencing other people's careers. And from there, I just kind of kept up my own personal development and learning journey and figuring out how could I be a better version of me so that I could be more emotionally satiated at work. It was you know, giving me a lot of the things that I needed and wanted at the time around financial goals, around, you know, mm-hmm. external achievements. But I didn't want to be the person that looked up and felt empty. And mm-hmm. so I would do these retreats. I would take trips, all kinds of things just to work on me. And I remember the year before I had my exit, actually, it was like six months before, I had a bunch of things that were on my bucket list. And I'd gotten, I'd negotiated like six weeks vacation that I'd never taken. And that year, nice. Yeah, that never taken them all in one year. I was just carrying over and carrying over. It was sad. And so 
that summer, my boss said to me at the beginning of the year, he goes, hey, I'm going to take four weeks this year. You're going to have to cover for me. Can you cover? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Where are you going? He goes, I've always wanted to go on like a photography safari. I'm taking my whole family, my kids, their partners, my wife, like a group of 12. And that where he goes, we're going and we're going to tour, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and do the things that I wanted to see that I read about. And we talked about that at the beginning of the year. And I was like, he goes, you should take all your vacation this year. I was like, all right. <laughs> so then. <laughs> so you had six weeks per year for a period of time? Is that yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. so you- yep. At that point, I had about six weeks. And so what I did was I planned a 10-day trip to the Himalayas. Mm, nice. With some friends, which turned into like a 21 day that I was going to take in the fall. And I was like, I still got days because it's only using about 15, 14 vacation days. So that's about two weeks. Right. And then before that, I decided that I would go to the Sacred Valley for about 10 days and hang out and see Machu Picchu and do a bunch of other things nice. that people do in Peru. You know, uh, you're speaking, but, uh, you know, you're. Going down the list of Mr. Amron's trips that he has taken as well here, as you're as you're saying this, <laughs> nice. so I, we we can compare notes about yeah. maybe some other trips you want to take or right. that I want to take after hearing about your trips. Right. Maybe yeah, that and so yeah. Bhutan had been number one on my bucket nice. list for like it's on my the list. happy place. Right? It's on yeah. My list. yeah, I've been twice. Oh, nice. uh, we got to talk. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. and so I convinced a few friends at like you know Michael's Genuine at the bar. I'm like, I got all these Afar magazines. Y'all want to go? And I was like, I'll do all the planning and just tell you where you got to wire the money. My one friend who went with me, she was an exec for a TV station. She goes, as long as I just got to wire money. Like, mm-hmm. Tell me where to go. She goes, you're going to plan everything, right? And yeah. I was like, yeah. And then another friend who had taken six months off before to do Asia and Africa on a sabbatical, she goes, you're planning everything. I go, yeah, I'm hiring a travel agent. That's what wow. I mean by planning. And so, yeah, went on that, right. came back, and then given a, an ultimatum. And I decided for the first time I was going to pick me. And that began my transition. I didn't want to move. I liked sunny weather. I liked not shoveling snow. Mm -hmm. I liked not doing things that involved wearing layers, which we don't have to do here in South Florida. (laughs) And so it started my journey. And I was like, you know what? I can rediscover myself. So that's the why. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. The how is, I'm sure, we talk about logistics of how you became an ICF coach and all that. and you know. But the why is why you became a coach is what you were just referencing. Yeah, and the how is, Mm -hmm. I figured out it was cheaper to go to coaching school than it was to hire a coach for that transition period. (laughs) And you know, I'm a little bit- Nice tip there, by the way. (laughs) I'm a little bit frugal. And so I didn't want to use too much of my swan fund, Mm -hmm. my sleep well at night. Mm -hmm. And so I went to coaching school instead. Hold on, I'm, I'm not going to let that sl- pass. I have a swan. Can we go back to that. I, that is fantastic. I've never heard it said that way, but I like it. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to start using it. Yeah, I got it from my financial swan. advisor. She goes, you need a swan fund. Sleep well at, at night. night. It's kind of like, you know, I some people it. say F you money, but it's the sleep no, well No, I at like night. that. It's a nicer way to Yeah, it's, it's a sleep a well at night. It's a mattress made of bills. No, <laughs> it's a mattress made of investments <laughs> right, and stocks right. that split. And so what does it look like? Everybody... You know, yeah. they tell you things like, you know, you should have short-term investment. After I paid off my student loans, that was the first thing I started doing. Was like, how can I build up my sleep well at night? Because I wanted to be able to make choices. A lot of times in my career, especially early on, mm-hmm. you guys know, you went to law school, what student loans are like. And so you make choices sometimes driven by the fact that you had that kind sure. of anchor. Sure, yeah. And sure. so when you're anchorless, what does that look like? Yeah. Right. So like money, you know, everyone talks about what is money, you know, I don't I don't need all that much, but but the only thing I money gives you options. Mm-hmm. Gives you choice. Yeah. It can't buy you love. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Sorry. Um, going down the Beatles wait, path. Uh, now. You no, guys but, are, but we're t- but it's it it gives you options, gives you a little power for yourself and control mm-hmm. over yourself and what you can do. Yeah. Right. Now, as a coach, I would say it gives you agency, right? So oftentimes right. you have collective agency, agency right. by proxy, and then you have individual agency. And so being resourced and less even about money, because I needed more than money for the sleep well at night, I needed examples of people who earned, who figured out a way mm-hmm. to take care of themselves and their lives mm-hmm. without a big corporation. And so one of the first things I did was start interviewing all my friends who had found a way to fund their lifestyles through either starting their own companies or becoming consultants or mm-hmm. speakers and ask them how they did it. Mm. Now, did you, were they aware that they were being interviewed? Well, that this was part of your exploration or did this sort of happen organically? I said, I have a, I have, I'm doing a pivot. Can you help? Like, can I just talk to you about what right. like, some had never worked for a, a corporation out of college. They just started doing their own thing. Right. I'm and always so, amazed by that. Yeah. Me People too. Start 
they're on. Yeah, and I'm Generation X, so that wasn't so common. And there's a lot of now. If I was graduating, I'd be like, yeah, there's. I don't think I need it because there's a lot of ways that you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. But then it wasn't. And so just kind of meeting with them and seeing what it was like and the things that I had possibilities around. Okay. Wow. Fascinating. You you had me in the very beginning when you first started coaching because you said you decided that you lacked the skills to advance in some way. And then you decided to start coaching. And I'm curious really about that process. Like, how did you come to that point? Because I'm always wondering, why, when does somebody get a coach? Like, when? how do you know you need a coach? And here, you know, you're a coach, so you first found that you needed a coach or you decided you wanted one. How'd you get there? Well, it wasn't that I had advanced. I got hired into a, a new role, right. and I was going to influence other people's careers, and I didn't want to be the person that was, wasn't was going to do a great job, like to be an exemplary leader who helped influence their career. And so it wasn't that I was doing bad or somebody told me. I just thought, I don't know if I know enough to have a great conversation. I told my leader at the time when I was doing a night, and he even said to me, like, you don't need that. You're amazing. And I was like, I feel like I could do a little bit more. Right. And so, and it started with reading, you know, Think and Grow Rich. And then from there. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> right. But that speaks to your self-reflection, right? Your ability to look inward and see what you perceive as a blind spot. Mm-hmm. That no one told you that. Everyone said, in fact, you were doing great. But you said, nah, right? And that takes a lot for somebody to actually look inward. And if they're doing well and they're on a great path, they just got promoted, got a new position, to say, you know, I, I really need some external work. I need to I need to do that and go do that. So, I mean, how did that did that take a long time for you to get to that point? And, you know. No, I think, you know, one of the concepts that I came up with later, and this was kind of naturally happening is you need a coven, and my coven had talked to me about this, right? And a so, what? I'm sorry, what's the word you're using? We're learning so much today. I really, coven. I'm, I'm going to, I like, need a glossary. You know, sort what of like a other? witch's coven, but oh, not really. Oh, okay. But gotcha. for me, it stands for people that you can have conversations with, discuss opportunities for victories, celebrating them or empowering them, building out an ecosystem, and then nurturing coven. The, the relationships. You need a coven. C-O-B-E-N. Yeah. Forum. It's like a forum. Like yes, a forum. it's like right. forum. That's right. But I have multiple ones. Right. I had met other women who were successful. And the more senior you get, the less people you have to talk to. Mm-hmm. And so they told me about things that they had done. And right. I was like, you know, I'm willing to try okay. that. Yeah. And so it, it's along that path of seeing people that I admire, that had balance in their lives, that I was like, I should explore more of these things. I have time. I can make time, especially if the return is high. And so that's what started the path of me doing self-development, self-improvement. After four or five years, that's when I decided like, oh, I'm going to pick me. Good. And then that's great. move forward. And I love that, like as to Brett's point, you made that decision not in the face of adversity, but in the face of success. Because you were being told you're amazing and you're like, well, I can be amazinger, mm-hmm. right? I can be yeah. more amazing or I can do better. I, I'm not at my best I'm not presenting my best self. Correct. And wow, really great. Cool. So, Ebenum Equation, Mm -hmm. these are your words, dedicated to cultivating forward thinking leaders. Mm -hmm. How is that? What what does that mean? And how is that different than like ordinary coaching? I think it's about helping people step away from the things they already know and taking that to build a strategy to move forward, whether it's for their organization, for their team, for themselves. In person, there's a great quote that I love that the future already exists. It's just not evenly distributed. Mm-hmm. So when you get these insights into your life, say a great vacation or a fantastic meal or a great experience with friends, how can you evenly distribute those types of experiences throughout your lived experience? Meaning have more? Have more. Yeah. Like just multiply it, right? And use it like this is what I found beautiful at one plus one equals three. If I take four plus seven and it, it equals 20, how can I just continue to multiply that? I like it. Those types of experience in my life. And so for a lot of my clients, they have those moments of absolute clarity where they're in their flow state, that they know they're using all their gifts, they're in purpose, but they don't know how to multiply that in other aspects of their lives, financially, with relationships, with people, with their children. How can we take that one thing that you see glimpses of and spread it out so that you're more emotionally satisfied in everyday life instead of just having these high points and to kind of take out. Valleys are are great because they help us reach the next high, 
but how can we make your valleys a little bit closer to your peaks? Right, less deep. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so there's not that cycle of despair right. to make you want to climb out of it. Right. Yeah. Less deep and less frequent, presumably, yes. right? Mm-hmm. So is this a mindset shift? Yes. yes. <laughs> in some ways, in some ways it's a mindset shift. In some ways it's about, I always say it's a 5% shift. Like if you just hone your habits 5% every day, 1,440 minutes in a day, 72 minutes you spend on yourself and like reflecting on what went really well and then scheduling more of that for, for the next day and then the next week and the next month, then you that's how you really do it. It's not like this, I need to go to an ashram and hang out for 45 days in silence and come back out a different person. <laughs> do, do, do Is this you, you guys, are you guys planning a trip right now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're... we're Quietly. 45 days of silence, does that sound appealing to you, Brett? Real, it actually really <laughs> no, does. It really, it, it does. <laughs> everyone that knows me knows that I'm not right. kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Without obviously giving detail and naming names, but like most of your clientele, to me, it would seem like they've achieved some level of success in their lives mm-hmm. and are at a point in their lives where they've worked hard, they've gotten to a point, they've had some success, and now it's like, okay, they want something to change in their lives personally for themselves, for their families, the relationship there, or their relationship with their business or a new venture. Is that kind of? No. No? Okay. So I would say when I first started, yes. Mm-hmm. But now that we do large corporate contracts, mm-hmm. uh, uh, okay. I don't pick the client. The client picks me. I understand. So I don't know who is selecting okay. me until we start booking because I'm kind of agnostic. If my company has a contract worth, say, like a tech company, I may get early career people. And so they may be, you know, the older edge of Generation Z, mm. or they may be sort of the younger millennials that are sort of zennials, right? And so for them, they may be five to seven years mm-hmm. out of college with work experience. And ready to retire. Not ready to no. retire quite yet. <laughs> they wish they could. But a lot of them are figuring out how yeah. to get more yeah. sooner because they, they see things in social media. Yeah. And so all of them want some kind of side hustle. All of them want to get promoted at work. Right. All of them want to have more experiences in life. And so I think when I first started my career, it was definitely people that were like Gen X and maybe, you know, younger baby boomers. Right. And now right. it's a different sort of clientele mm-hmm. of people. And then the one thing about Generation Z is they're all used to having coaches because you guys all helicopter parented. And mm-hmm. so they're used she was to pointing at you, Brett. <laughs> I, you can't I'm see sure Brett's my, face. My kids in Gen yeah, Z. Podcast. I'm not even. Maybe older. I, uh, I have a 20, a 17, and a 13 year old. They are all Gen Z. Damn. Yeah, That's all Jeff's okay. fault, really. No mind. Yeah. Yeah. You're they're okay. they're used to being like supported yeah, and nurtured. Of course. Of course and right. so they're also yeah. very open to talking about where they want to go, what their aspirations right. are, and like, right. can you help me with a pathway there? Right. Yeah. Or help yeah. me suss out so, a pathway there. They're thinking longer term than we were at that age. Oh, like, for I was sure. What's the next step? Get a job, you know, work, and, you know, said. right. I yeah. mean, How can was, I pay Sally Mae? Yeah. Right. I wanted to, yeah. like, my student loans were uh, <laughs> overwhelming. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. How yeah. can I pay it and still buy a house? Right, and I think the younger generation, as you said, are, look, are looking forward. But I think that's a good thing to have somebody to help and pathways. But I think sometimes, and I'm not saying it's generational, but sometimes people get lost in the, well, yeah, but you, gotta, you still got to work hard to get there. Right. Uh, no, they all are willing to work hard. Gen Z. And I would say most of the clients that I've worked yeah. with are all willing to work hard. Yeah. They are also want to discover their blind spots faster. Okay. And that's some sometimes the coaching difference, yeah. right? Is that it helps you discover your blind spots faster. Uh-huh. And are you just working on the things that are important and urgent? Or are you right. working on the things that are not urgent but also important? Uh-huh. And so a lot of the work we do is on the not urgent but important things in their lives. Okay. Because the urgent and important things take care of themselves because Mm -hmm. it's like putting out a fire. But how much time do you spend on the important but not urgent? And then also what parts of their blind spots in their own personalities can they begin to develop Mm -hmm. and get transferred in so that they can utilize them sooner? What you said is now a lot of your clientele, you're getting signed up with corporations and then you're available to people who want to sign up? Yeah, because they're hiring my firm for Mm -hmm. like, and we'll bring in 15 coaches. And I'm on the roster for... X number. Right. Um, just because I want to see what the client's culture is like when they ask me for feedback. Sure. And anybody can pick me, right? I'm like any other employee on the days that I'm working in the business versus the days that I'm working on the business. You guys know right. this. Yeah. And so. All one-on-one. 
These are all one-on-one sessions or are they groups? It, it, sometimes they're groups, sometimes they're one-on-one, sometimes oh, okay. they're, they're uh, cohorts where I'm working with a small group of like 15 people. And so I don't, and they may have one-on-one sessions with me. So as my business model shifted and the company grew, mm-hmm. then also how I developed clients grew as well and shifted. And so I then got less attached to the one-on-one chemistry and the, just realizing that I can build a connection with any human being. And so then you unlock different superpowers when you realize that if you choose to, mm-hmm. you can build that connection with people. Hmm. Wow. So is it big companies only or small companies? Like what, who, who should hire you? Uh, it's a mix, honestly. I have like Amlaw 100 law firms. I have like a law firm that's four lawyers. I have large tech companies that have 150,000 employees. Right. I have a tech firm that when I started with them, they had nine, now they're at 100. Right. So it really depends. But I also, you know, we do government work as well. And so I, I don't know who I'm getting when I sign an agency contract and that I commit to servicing that contract for five years. You just don't know. Right. And when you, I mean, you mentioned here that some, that some people, they want to do a side hustle. And so when you're coaching mm-hmm. an individual for a company, how does that company know that where you're coaching this individual on is advancing their cause, you know, the company cause, if you will, rather than building their side hustle and, you know, and planning their off ramp or something. It's never really about the full side hustle. It's, right. I need something else to do. Sometimes there's a lot of interesting people that don't have enough interests. Mm-hmm. Right. So then once they get more interests, then the analogy I use is if you consider yourself a plate of food, your life. Some people center their career on the entree, when instead it should be a really satisfying side dish like at Thanksgiving. It's the stuffing, it's a really good casserole, but it's not the tofu turkey. I know y'all vegans. Strong. (laughs) I was waiting for that. It's not the tofu turkey. Right? And so- I'm impressed that you remember that. (laughs) What would it look like if you had your non-work life as the entree, and then you had all these amazing, the starter dish was work, all these strong side dishes were part of work- and you didn't look for work to be the fulcrum or the catalyst for everything you did in your life. Right. What you do, not who you are. Correct. Yeah. And, or the funder, right? You gleefully go in because right. you know it funds so many other things, right. right? When I was working, I understood it was the funder. Yeah. So I'm right. going to do well here so that I can go hike in the Himalayas. Yeah. yeah. Right? I'm going to do well here so that I can you know, go volunteer at Habitat for Humanity. And I used to do it all the time. One, to be helpful. But then two, I had a house that needed remodeling. I didn't have any money. I was still paying off student loans. So if I go volunteer for a sheetrock day for drywalling, mm-hmm. then in a month <laughs> I could go drywall my own basement. <laughs> and so purpose driven. <laughs> purpose driven yes. service. And so one of the guys that I, one of the engineers that I work with at one of my first jobs, he goes, I'm like, how are you remodeling this house? He goes, Girl, just go volunteer. Help people build their own houses. And then you'll get comfortable and you'll start doing it on your own. And that's literally what I did. I was like, I'm doing under cabinet lighting. He goes, you got this. You can put it under cabinet lighting. You can, you know, remove all the wallpaper, paint your house. I signed up for painting duty. I learned how you cut in, do all those things mm-hmm. early on. And so, like, I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed the fact that I was remodeling my first house. And I felt moments where I was super happy. And I didn't. No. And so how do you get more people to say like, hey, my life's full based on the interests that I have, the hobbies that I have, how I'm engaging with my community and how can I move forward? And so I think, you know, it's all you have to figure out what your right mix is. Is it a, is it a side hustle? Is it community involvement? Is it joining boards? Is right. it mentoring other people? Being a big brother, big sister. Sometimes side hustles aren't always about business. Right. For a lot of people, it's about joining nonprofit boards and affecting right. the communities in which they live or showing other people how right. to get out. And that could also be your side hustle. It doesn't right. always have to be monetary as they give as the reward that you get. Right. I have friends who that's what they do. Like they're always on a nonprofit board and helping them raise money. They're like, Oh yeah, I work with people who have some discretionary income. Let me hit them up. But also I can affect change where I live. Right. And so that could also be the side hustle. So it's as finding well. it's really about finding purpose or finding joy or where where do you find purpose and joy and meaning in your life and mm-hmm. how do you focus energy there? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, like, so some of the side hustles aren't just about starting other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, there's gotcha. people that, and look, I mean, as you evolve as a person, right, you get different interests and you want to do different things, but there may be a struggle when the central focus is work, 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 which, listen, I mean, for some of us, I mean, that was how it was when we were younger, and okay, we didn't know, like like you said, like our generation, that's all we did, that we didn't, you know, maybe with that now we became the helicopter parents and now our, our kids think differently, how do you address the, I just want to do what I'm passionate about? Like, do you get that a lot now from, you know, some of the people that you meet with? And No, I, I, I don't because a lot of them, when they decide to take on a coach, they understand what they're passionate about. A lot of them are working on the important but non-urgent and blind spots. I got you. Okay. Right? And so it really is honing in on how can I be a, a slightly different version of me? Mm-hmm. And so sometimes their passions are already set. Like, I'm always amazed. Like, oh, yeah, I I have an LLC. You have an LLC for tax purposes. There's some things that, you know, need to be written off. And we have an LLC. I have a, I'm in a multifamily home. I'll be in this for another five years. And then we're going to buy another multifamily home. I was like, you've thought this out already at 28? Yeah. I started following this guy on YouTube, right? And that's uh-huh. the difference. Yeah, that's access. To it's information. access to information. information. Yeah, we didn't have. Right? We didn't have that, right? To know that I should get my my first home should be a multifamily. Even something as simple as you want to, you know, change. You want to do something in your house. Even you were saying you can go train. You can Google it on YouTube, and there's a dozen or more videos of exactly the thing that you're trying to do of people showing you how to do it. It's Correct. amazing. No matter what, it doesn't. Yeah. No matter what. I, I changed the battery and had to reprogram the code on the pad for my garage door, the exterior pad. I had I had my option of choices on YouTube of how to do it, and I did it, and it worked. In, I mean, easy, no problem. Yes. All right. I think it's that access to information that makes them a little bit less about the passion because they've been discovering it. They've always right, had right. Yeah. a yeah, smartphone, yeah, yeah. right? Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so those kind of things aren't the tip of the iceberg for them. A lot of them is about like, I want to fund things that I'm passionate about. Right. How do I get to that? How do I get right. to that point? Yeah. And so how do I get resourced? And whether it's connections or people, right. or how do I create a, a personal board of directors? Mm. What's, what's the ask? What's the, the right way to ask without offending? And we talk about you know that we're in a reciprocity economy. And so what, how do you get your reciprocity advantage in order for you to be able to ask people if they would be on your personal board of directors and things like that? That's what Generation Z is worried about. They want access to people who've experienced it already. Mm -hmm, Yeah. So they can get the shortcut. To get there faster. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little bit about the Leadership Academy? Sure. As opposed to Equation. So the Leadership Mm -hmm. Academy, you are teaching leaders to be coaches? Correct. And this is for organizations generally who want to bring in a coaching culture to retain employees. And so we will come in, instead of doing like a your typical like you know, take these lunch and learns, this kind of training. We go in with the intention that when they're done, they'll have the things they would typically get in your lunch and learns, but they would also become certified coaches at the end. And so a company hires you to do that? Because mm-hmm. is this is the leadership academy competing with with the equation entity? I would say no. They're complementary. Some people need to go deeper. And for, I got government contracts around this. Right. That's why. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You go where the market goes. And so the government trains a lot of their employees to become coaches so they can coach their people internally. Right. So Because the leaders leaders understand the culture. So it's not somebody in their direct reporting line often. It'll be another leader in another part of the agency and they will get internal coaching. And so it's about creating the coaching culture for them. And so for companies that have done it, it's really about how do we create a coaching culture to retain our employees? Because we have unemployment rates that are, we talked about this when we were at the at the forum, that we're at a historic lows and our birth rates are going down. So there's nobody else in the pipeline. So you need to keep the people you have. Right. And how do you do that? By having creating a better employee experience. And then there also needs to be a new, you know, I guess, batch of leaders in that group as well as, you know, they say leaders aren't born. Or is, do you agree with that? I mean, can anyone? Can you train anyone to be a leader? Or some people have it and some people don't. You intrinsically want to say, yes, I want to get better. So I am, some people are conversion coaches. I only preach to the converted. Conversion coaches meaning? Like they'll work with somebody who doesn't, who thinks they're perfect and don't need to change. Uh, versus I want to work with people right. who say, hey, I see that there's opportunity. Mm-hmm. How do I multiply that for myself? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, Jeff's the... I'm converted. He, yeah, I mean, he, no, he thinks he's perfect, so you wouldn't want to work with him. <clears throat> yeah, but there's always more perfect. Wow. I, yeah, so no, humble. I, on the other hand... <laughs> so humble. I, he's very humble. <laughs> Jeff is well known for that. You said something in there that we, I would love to come back or have... God, I would, to me, this is almost a panel. Right. At a future forum, even, uh, would be conversation about the workforce and the future workforce because mm-hmm. like you said right there's less people and mm-hmm. then there's the pipeline is light because birth rates are down like what's going to happen you know in the next generation i think the fight for talent at the projections from bls it's like 2030 it continues to be tight until 2030 we need more of generation z right. to enter the mm-hmm. workforce mm-hmm. the problem with generation z is Mm-hmm. And existing industries is every year new jobs come up that didn't exist when we all started to work. Right. Right. Like right. prompt engineer. Prompt right. engineer pays a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. It's for English majors. Those jobs didn't exist last year this time. Right. right. And so for that incoming generation, say your youngest child, right. they're going to do something that. Yeah, it's not even, it doesn't even exist. doesn't right even now. exist right now. Right. right. And so when you look at my company, was started from the idea when I was on my career break. From watching two TED Talks in 2014, mm-hmm. one by a guy named Hans Rosling, who talked about birth rate effects. It was a TED Talk in, I think it was in Qatar. And then one given by uh, a gentleman that is a partner at BCG, Rainer Stark, who talked about that 2020 was the year we would face the employee crisis. Mm. So for five years, I've been waiting for this inflection point because as a trader, you buy the rumor and sell the news. And so this was a foresight event that I saw. And so now when we look at the data going back, we're in the middle of deglobalization. And so what does that look like? So for us, we our birth rates are the same with immigration. But if we shut our borders, we don't have enough people in the United States. We live in a state right now, unemployment is 2.9%. Right. And they are increasingly trying to shut the borders and restrict. Yes. And so people left, right? right. right. And so the people that are unemployed, are the people that don't want a job. They're retired. Right. right. They're retired. They they don't want to join the workforce. And so, and if you look at where birth rates are going around the globe, China is the fast aging population. Russia in the 90s doubled their death rate and half their birth rate. Those people that are now fighting on the front lines in the Ukraine, that's their next generation. Yeah. That's vastly not going to be a great productive part of society. So I think we begin to think about that AI isn't, progressing fast enough, but then also how do you keep the people you have? And so that's really the work that I do. How do you keep the people you have, help them find how to fit in culturally, Mm -hmm. but also be satisfied in the work that they're doing, that they want to be intrinsically motivated to come back. And wouldn't also part of that be, how do you create the culture that is going to bring in the next generation? And part of that is, right, coaching up the current people to want to stay, but then that you have that culture that will bring in the next generation as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And are you doing outreach in the community already? Are you doing all kinds of things that are happening? Mm-hmm. And so I think those things become really important. And so, yeah, that's the work. And for a lot of the companies, the people where, where your pipeline came from, like mm-hmm. say if they're, you know, non-melanated men, Will you have to widen your scope to bring in people who look less like the founders so that you can, one, tap into a consumer market that is burgeoning and you are not typically designing for so that you have other voices in the room and knowledge so that you can tap into that marketplace? And so that's also part of the work that we do, right? Mm -hmm. Because people know like, oh, that won't work with that consumer group or that particular group. That's a mismatch in culture and abilities, a mismatch in language, and what does that look like? And so for a lot of the companies, they're also looking to make sure that they're staying, they have talent that can help them stay in front of that next set of consumers. That it's not just about retention, it is also about there's this whole set of consumers that looks different than say, Generation Z looks so much different than Generation X. When you look at demographics, that they'll have to figure out what their consumer set is going to look like in five to seven years. And so mm-hmm. we need people that understands that generation so that we can stay relevant as a brand. And so that's a lot of the work that I do. Yeah, uh, that's very cool. I think we could make this a, a multi-part series <laughs> in this podcast. For sure, because we haven't even talked about her her trips, which, you know. Yeah, I, we're going to have to save gonna, that. But can I ask, of all the places you've been, or places you've been, what's your favorite so far? I'll just, I'll ask that question. Does that sound? 
home. Dude, can she answer it? Or I don't, she's I don't know. Oh, no, no, I can ask Honestly, it. No, no, she can't answer. We're just going to end it there. Click <clears throat> here. No, I'm just, go ahead. Home. Sorry. Home. 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 Oh, no, I can't, nice. that's, that's an, uh, that. no, I like that on the way home. I yeah, appreciate home. that. But what's the favorite place that you've traveled to away from home? So by, by the way, home, you mean Miami, South Florida. I think it's wherever I rest my wherever head. Wherever home is right. Okay. Yeah. I think it, for me, my house should rise up to greet me. I make sure it's feng shui. It's surrounded by things that I've collected on my travels and experiences that I've had. Mm-hmm. Right. My house has my photography up, blown right. up gallery style, and things that I've done and taken. And it reminds me of a rich and abundant life. Mm-hmm. Of the places I've gone that I've been back to. Italy, just for the food mm-hmm. and culture. And, and I can disconnect because I don't speak the language, so, which is great. I'm not, <laughs> right, I don't yeah. think I need to go make, make small talk. Of places that are different than how I live, probably Bhutan, and just disconnecting, you know, and looking at the contrast of being in a town that has 5G but no electricity. Mm-hmm. Right? You got yeah. Nelson's attention with that one. Huh? <laughs> that, that's in the Himalayas. Yeah. 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 So, right, they skipped over landlines and yep. things like that, yep. right? And so what does it look like when you leapfrog technology and infrastructure doesn't have to get put in? And so being in a small town, like probably we were a 10-hour drive from the airport and we were talking to a 13-year-old girl and I was like, oh, do you speak English? And she's like, yeah. I was like, you do? She says, yeah, my teacher's Canadian. Mm. And I was like, oh, your teacher in the village? She goes, mm-hmm, she's here, she's Canadian. And so we were talking just to her about life. And I was like, oh, what do you want to be? She goes, not married for sure. I was like, what? She goes, there's no good husbands. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, you're 13 yeah. in the Himalayas? How do you have this yeah. jagged life view? And she's like, look, I want to like live my own life. I want to do these things. And she's in a, yeah. a Buddhist village and yeah. she knows those things. Why? Because she got 5G. That's right. Which is unfortunate in many ways, but great in many ways, it right? Is, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And so you see though, you know, that kind of contrast and you're like, oh, yeah. What would it look like if I had that kind of contrast in my life? And so I would say for me, because I've gone back twice, that it was a good reset. I spent 10 days in country just kind of meditating and Mm -hmm. hanging out and talking to llamas and seeing the contrast, but also seeing how people live, right? And going into homes and getting snacks and drinking yak milk tea and realize that food isn't imported everywhere, right? We go to Whole Foods you can get whatever you want all year round. We were there and we were in the fall season and we realized at the time that everything was sponsored by the color beige. <laughs> so think about all the vegetables that you grow in the fall climate. It's potatoes. It's cauliflower. Literally everything was beige. Um, <laughs> and we found one place that a Swiss guy had bought and started a hotel for travelers and he had a greenhouse and we had salad. They don't import salad in. And so I was like, oh, my God, you guys have salad? He's like, yes. And I was like, oh, can we have some? He goes, in the country there, you can't go to the restaurant. You have to call them the day before so they cook food for you. for you. Wow. You can't just walk in and sit down. The things we take for granted. Yeah, the content, like Uber Eats, DoorDash doesn't exist. But, like, I wanted to go to a restaurant where you make a reservation the day before, and they make sure that they prepare food for you. I like it. Yeah. And so that, that level of contrast helped me appreciate home. But also appreciate that other people are living magnificent lives without the things that yep. I enjoy here. Yeah. And that was part of the beauty of it. That you think you need. That many people think they need. Yes. Right. Or we've normalized. Well, we normalize right? Our right. society is just normalized right. around it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so I like the contrast. I agree. But a llama has made me cry many a times talking over non-emotional things. <laughs> All right. We're saving that for the next podcast episode, please. We <laughs> got to have something. I agree. Okay. All right. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, share it, and leave a review. Subscribing to the show and leaving reviews helps others find the show. If you help others find the show, that'll help us grow and help us devote more time, produce better content, have special guests like Ebony on here, and we will all live happily ever after. Thank you, Ebony. This Ebony. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Great stuff. Thank Nelson. You Thank you. Nelson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey. For more information on this show and other resources, visit FastAmron.com and connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at FastAmron.com.